Courtship's a really old-fashioned term, and it sounds strange today. I'd suggest wooing a timid maiden or something like that. But it's useful because it makes us think about what it is we're doing. It makes it sound much less natural than the terms we're used to, like dating or going out. And so I wanted to distance ourselves a little bit from just the assumptions that this is always how it's been. It was a period of rapid change, actually. One of the things that most people don't realize is that dating as a system is relatively new and fairly short-lived. In the late 19th century up into the early 20th century, basically the way it was supposed to work is that the young man would be invited by a woman or her parents to come to her home. And they would sit in the parlor or on the front porch and listen to her play the piano or have a conversation. Uh, she was the one who had the right to invite him. And advisors were very specific on this point. He was supposed to suggest by his pleasant demeanor that he would welcome an invitation. But it was considered very rude and ill-bred for him to take the initiative. Much more formal. On the other hand, these are the rules. And one of the things that's clear in courtship throughout the ages is that people break the rules. And this was also a set of rules that applied much more to people in urban settings, the middle class and upper middle class. Young people in the lower classes often went out to dance halls and wandered around the streets because they didn't really have the setting or, you know, the cultural assumptions that said they would sit in the parlor and play the piano. It depended, again, on uh, where you were, what class you were, who your parents were. Many immigrant parents kept a very, very close rein on their daughters and wouldn't let them be alone with a man until they were married. But there was a greater sense of involvement in some ways of the parents and the community in supervising the processes of courtship. And there was a much greater sense that courtship was a process that was going to lead to marriage instead of the way it works today where there's a great deal more uh, interaction with people that you have no intention of marrying. It's, it's a very long process. The marriage education movement uh, was based on the rise of a belief in science and social sciences in the uh, early to mid-20th century. And people thought if you could use scientific research to improve society, you had a responsibility to do so. So a lot of social scientists took as their subject family, life, and love and started doing very detailed survey investigations and scientific, social scientific research on how people meet, court, fall in love, and tried to figure out how to detect what would make a good marriage. So young people in colleges that ranged from Ivy League to community colleges uh, would often encounter a class called marriage education where they didn't study the sociological aspects of courtship or, date or mating or anything, but instead learned a very nuts and bolts how-to. You know, if you propose in a car, you have a less likelihood of having a successful marriage than if you propose on the front porch of your parents' house. It was a highly flawed paradigm because essentially what they were doing was studying the way things were and then using that as prescriptive data, making rules based on what people did. And in fact, because society changed over time, many of the things that worked well in 1940 in middle class families in the Midwest weren't especially effective other places. And uh, basically one of the, the uh, main people in this movement, a man named Ernest Burgess, I found at the bottom of his set of lecture notes once for a University of Chicago marriage education class the question, once they fall in love. He recognized very clearly that even though he proposed counseling and quantitative testing to see about compatibility, that in the face of love, all this stuff didn't necessarily work very well. It changed the sexual revolution of the 60s, but it wasn't a, a smooth path to that point. Basically, after calling, we get a process of dating that has two very separate uh, periods before World War II and after World War II. Uh, and dating was a system that centered on money. That was the core change. Men's money made dating possible. Dating was defined as going out and spending money, going out into a public place of commercial entertainment. And that threw everything into a very, very complicated situation because what does the man get for his money? He spends the money, the woman uh, gives her company, and that was supposed to be the answer. On the other hand, a lot of people saw that equation as fundamentally unbalanced. And so young men would say things like, I spent two dollars on her, at least I should have gotten a little necking in exchange. Mm -hmm. And the term date actually came from prostitution originally. It's not a term used in prostitution today coming over from regular courtship. It was the other direction. 
Uh, so that was critical there. Things changed pretty dramatically in the 1960s, and some of that is really fitting into the myth of the 1960s. Some of it is really because young people took up the banners of change. It's because of the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, all sorts of purposeful changes. But it's also possible that these things changed because of major structural changes in American society in the first place, because uh, there was a stronger national culture and local controls were losing force, because the rules that were governing the lives of young people were not making sense, because people were doing all sorts of things sexually in private that they would never admit to in public. But that hypocrisy and that disparity was becoming ever more difficult to sustain. But I bet that most of them don't realize that they disagree with a lot of their peers, and that's what's interesting here. There's a great deal of assumed, uh, people assume that they know what they're talking about when they say dating, and here we see that people have radically different ideas about what it means. And that's one of the changes, I think, in the period before the sexual revolution, before women's liberation, et cetera, there was a much clearer sense of what the rules were. Uh, people knew what it meant if you said you were going on a date. People knew who was supposed to call, who was supposed to pay. People knew what was expected. And that's gone. So you may find yourself trying to become involved in a relationship with somebody who has a whole different set of definitions than you do and acting at cross purposes. It was easier as a process. I mean, people knew what things meant. Uh, it was harder, I think, in many ways as an act because it was so fraught with danger. So much of the process of dating was a question of negotiating a woman's uh, reputation. You, it's hard to imagine how thoroughly a woman's reputation, a girl's reputation, could be ruined by a sexual misstep on a date and what a tightrope people were walking at the time. It's an enormous way it's changed. I think sex is still a highly charged issue in society today and between individuals who are trying to get together today. But it's not quite the same thing as it was in that transition period of the 1960s. The, the young man who said people didn't even talk about sex back then is wrong. Uh, people before the sexual revolution were doing a great deal of sexual exploration. It was private, though. Um, and it was also a different set of, of acts. Basically, the idea was not to have sexual intercourse. And to some extent, what that me meant is that what we would call the missionary position was the final frontier. And people did all sorts of other sexual acts that we might think of as being a little bit more extreme as a way to maintain what was called technical virginity. But sex was something that was going on. It was something that was a highly charged issue back then, too. No, I think sex is more present it's more today. Open. It's more open. Uh, there, people have to make up their own minds more about what the consequences will be. It's more of a decision based on what a person believes, uh, what her or his immediate situation, consequences, and beliefs are. And I think that makes it more of a moral choice than it was before when people made their decisions much more based on fear and uh, fear of pregnancy. The pill in the 1960s when it was um, became prescribed for contraception, they wouldn't prescribe, doctors wouldn't prescribe to unmarried women commonly, and that's the only way to get it. And so something had to change into society that allowed doctors to give unmarried women the pill before the pill could make it easier for unmarried women to have sex without being afraid that they'd get pregnant. Well, our society is much more sexualized than it used to be. The image this, that we see when we turn on the television or go to a movie or pick up a magazine would have been shocking to people a couple of generations ago. Not that they didn't know these things existed necessarily, but they were outside the boundaries of respectable culture. Um, so to some extent, our, our assumptions about how things look and how things happen have changed because of our public culture. But also, there is the sense that if a young man and a young woman want to have a relatively committed relationship, they may well move in together. And that's what I see as one of the most profound uh, consequences of the sexual revolution, that you can have a sexual relationship with somebody you care about and it is not seen as a destruction of that relationship and a loss of, of reputation. They've been very important um, and part of that is that our society has become increasingly mobile socially, geographically, and so on. And the media is part of what ties us together today. And that's one of the ways that people make television. connections. Particularly television. And the movies. Yeah, the movies, uh, the internet now. People meet each other. Uh, people form certain kinds of relationships. And in some ways, I think it's a really wonderful thing because it means that people are making contact with each other based not on physical characteristics necessarily, but 
forming a basis before they find out whether somebody looks like their ideal sex goddess from the movies or whatever. But it also is uh, a sign of the ways in which our societies have fragmented because you're not meeting people necessarily through traditional forms of uh, the, the neighborhood school or the neighborhood church or the neighborhood community organization. This has been going on for a long time, though. And uh, it's both a freeing, but it's also it's, it's a side of certain kinds of dangers, and people should be careful. Uh, you know, there are success stories. I, I don't think is necessarily the most effective way to find somebody, but more and more people meet through um, activities, through work, through endeavors that are open to, to both men and women, if you're talking about heterosexual courtship. And um, I think that's still the easiest, best way to meet somebody through shared interest. But it doesn't always happen. And I think it's good that in our society we have various other ways for people to attempt to find somebody if, if that's what they're looking for. I mean, it's not that somebody can't be single and have a wonderfully fulfilled life. But our society does tend to focus on couples, and many people really want someone, some specific someone, to share their life with. I think it's made it easier for men and women to meet, to meet, but it doesn't mean that it made it smoother for men and women to form a committed relationship. Part of what's happened is in the 1950s, 47% uh, of American women were married by the time they were 19. So this is coming pretty much straight out of high school. Things hadn't gotten complicated yet. People didn't have their own lives and their own major histories to deal with. So when people work in the, meet in the workplace today, often they have many different factors pulling them in different directions. Uh, one or the other of them may be married. It's, it's not a smooth, easy course, but I think it also can make for a much stronger bond than women in one world and men in another. It's something I've been giving thought to because I have a, a 12 and a half year old son who is beginning to venture into this world and I'm realizing that the role of parents is just trepidation all the way through. Um, I think that we will maintain a fair amount of egalitarianism in relationships. So even though some of the students at UNM who said they were traditional and that they believed that men should pay, the men should invite, you still couldn't see them going to the point of masquerading and the woman pretending she wasn't as smart or giving up her own life to settle into his life. I think that uh, there's probably a little more sexual conservatism than there has been in the past because of the fear of AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, but I think that it's going to be a continued minefield to walk through and the best laid plans don't always work out. It's about the sexual revolution in Lawrence, Kansas, and I wanted to talk about the sexual revolution not as something that happened on the radical fringes of society in Greenwich Village or in Berkeley, um, but as something that really did happen in the heartland of America and the changes that are fundamental to the way we as Americans in general see the world. Because if it just took place in radical communities, it wouldn't have been a revolution. It would have been, uh, you know, a set of bohemians making claims about sex. So this is an investigation of what happened from World War II on through the 1970s in, in terms of sex. And I think one of the central things that changed is the way in which gender roles are negotiated and play a role. I think that there was a move in the late 60s to start talking about relationships as being based on two people coming to know each other as people. And not to write off sex, and not to write off physical attraction, and not to write off love, but to claim equality as the basis for that relationship. There was um, a case in 1968 at Barnard College in New York in which a woman named Linda LeClaire was discovered to be living off campus with her boyfriend, Peter Baer, who was a Columbia student. And she was brought up on charges at Barnard and ultimately banned from the cafeteria as punishment. But this became a huge case in newspapers throughout the country. And, you know, everything from the Columbus Ledger in Georgia to, uh, you know, the Boston Globe, major papers were writing columns and, and running stories about this young woman. Letters were pouring in, calling her a whore. The idea that because she lived with her boyfriend, she became a prostitute, an alley cat, uh, a, a, a focus for anger from all over the country, is almost inconceivable today. And that's what I see as a fundamental change in the sexual revolution. Love doesn't necessarily conquer all, but it sure does complicate everything. <laughs>